and welcome to the ESG Experience Podcast brought to you by Gobi, the ESG platform. I'm Healy Lev, Gobi's Chief Revenue Officer. And I'm Ryan Nelson, Gobi's CEO, and we're your hosts for this podcast. Whether you're an ESG expert or just dipping your toes in the ESG universe to understand how it can help with engaging stakeholders, mitigating risks, and attracting investors, this podcast is for you. Together, we will navigate the alphabet soup of ESG, discuss ideas, review strategies, and share industry news and trends. In today's episode, we will be discussing the growing demand for ESG in private equity. To help us really dive into this topic, we are honored to be accompanied by Pamela Hendrickson, Vice Chairman at the Riverside Company. Pam joined the Riverside Company in 2006 and currently serves as the Vice Chairman. In her over 15 years at Riverside, she oversaw tremendous growth as the firm grew from 750 million in assets to over 10 billion in assets under management from three fund strategies to nine. Whoa, I didn't even know that, that's awesome. (laughs) Um, She still supervises some of the newer funds and manages policy and legislative risk globally for Riverside and its portfolio companies. Pam has done everything from developing a nifty credit card during her 22 years at JP Morgan to driving establishment of a well-regarded financial tracking system for Riverside portfolio companies. She's a frequent speaker on many topics and has even given testimony in the United States Congress. Whoa, I didn't know that either. (laughs) She lives in New York City with her husband and dog and has two adult children who also live and work in New York City. Welcome, Pam. We are delighted to have you. Welcome. Great to be here. Excellent. Um, Well, again, you know, we're really pleased to have you, Pam. Obviously, your experience is spot on. with the topic today of talking about the growing demand of of ESG disclosures in private equity. So again, we really appreciate it. We've got a kind of a series of questions we'll throw at you and um, help lead the conversation. So I'll dive right in. You manage policy, political, and legislative risk for a global private equity firm. We're interested in describing the differences between adoption of ESG in Europe versus the United States. What is your opinion or what are you seeing between um, those two places? You know, I think there's no question that adoption in Europe has been historically happening and um, is is more serious. And I think maybe that's because the countries are smaller and there's less of a political division. Um, I see that actually I have a house on a small island and and they're very ESG forward, you know, there's no plastic allowed, et cetera. And I think it's because they're small. And so they realize that it's really critical to them to be environmentally forward. Um, So as of the end of March, there is some new regulations in, there are some new regulations in Europe that impose a lot of detailed disclosure requirements on both European companies as well as any US fund manager who's raising money in Europe under the private placement rules. Um, The goal of the new regulations is to try and create some sort of common language. There's actually 30 mandatory sustainability measures so that, you know, firms are held to some standard and they don't, they're not greenwashing. Uh, to use the sure. technical term that that mm-hmm. people sometimes use. Um, meanwhile, European LPs have been viewing ESG as very important for a long time. Um, there are many who even you know won't consider investing in your fund if you don't have some kind of program or are not in some cases a signatory to the PRI. Um, in the U.S., on the other hand, LPs have asked more peripherally about ESG, and until fairly recently, I would say it was more of a box checking exercise. I was just talking to someone on our fundraising team, and she said, you know, in the six months prior to the current six months, and maybe that was because COVID kind of threw everything for a loop, but she said, I got zero questions. Now, I would say of due diligence questionnaires, we're getting one to two a week from from U.S. LPs. So I think both U.S. investors as well as the regulatory regime are changing. Um, And that the the regulatory regime in the U.S. will start with the public companies, but for sure it's going to trickle down to privates. Um, 
increasingly, I think also, we're seeing both European and US LPs request a lot more measuring around diversity and inclusion. So it's not just at the firm level, but also within your portfolio companies. And it's, you know, how many of those, it's, it's one thing if um, you have diversity, but there's no decision makers who are in that diversity population. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're looking at that very strongly. Yeah, well, that's very interesting. I uh, appreciate your insight there. Of course, when you talk about LPs, you're referring to limited partners, those right, investors, firms, yep. institutions that invest in private equity. And so they're interested in um, how the firms that are managing their investments, you know, what, what they, they think about ESG and how they're spending that money and what their process is. I like your theory on uh, uh, we talk a lot about how Europe is leading, but I like your theory on perhaps why. Uh, being the size of the countries and maybe just less political red tape. Um, it's interesting. But anyway, as a, as a global private equity firm, you, you have to be aware and, and deal with um, deal with both the U.S. and Europe. So it's very, very interesting. I appreciate that. Well, it's also, the Europeans it's, have always schooled us when it comes to environmental regulation and yeah, but, but why? Have we ever explored why? That's <laughs> right. Uh, well, I was just sort of thinking just about better the why of it. We are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I do, I do think there there are important, there are critical reasons to do this. Um, but I also do think that the why does have to do with, you know, if you're very reliant on your own resources and you're small, mm -hmm. then yeah. you, you just can't afford to not have them. Whereas we've been benefic you know, the beneficiaries in the United States of having a lot of resources. Yeah, it's, that's exactly what I was going to say. I remember I studied abroad in Copenhagen, okay, in Denmark. And I had like a, a host family. It's a family of four, two like teenage girls. And um, the family had one car, it was like this tiny little hatchback. And that was like their family car, like a two door hatchback. They all shared it. It was a completely normal thing, like, you know, upper middle class family. And that's just how they roll in, in Copenhagen. And I was thinking of like the same family here would probably have like two Jeeps and like, you know, another, like a third car for the. So it just, I think it's just baked into their DNA as part of it. But like you said, smaller countries, I, resources, I but they're just kind of used to it. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, cool. So um, we talked a little bit about LPs. I recently had a call with a lady um, who manages the, the New York City pension fund and just asking her like what kind of demands they're putting on their GPs. Um, she said that she felt that it was still, it was definitely coming out of that check the box or like greenwashing phase that you said, or the GPs who have maybe had a homegrown program up until this point, that was fine for their last fundraise. But as they go to raise their new fund, that's not going to cut it anymore. And the LPs are becoming a bit more demanding of ESG programs that um, go beyond just a firm wide policy that have more tentacles that extend into the actual investments themselves. Um, so how do you guys as a firm engage with your LPs on, on ESG topics? Um, and, and another example of this that in my own experience, so our VC, they'll circulate a handful of different spreadsheets that come from different LPs, both um, domestic and Canadian. And essentially, it feels like they're all asking the same questions, but they're all doing it in like their own Excel format or um, in their own way. So from your experience, how are you guys interfacing with the LPs? What are they asking for? Um, what trends do you see? And is there any consistency with how they're asking or the format they're asking or the frequency that they're asking? Um, it's so funny you say that, Healy. So we actually, as River said, we actually have over 100 pages of due diligence questionnaire answers from stuff we've just gotten from our investors. Over 100 pages yeah. on just wow. on the topics of ESG, diversity, and inclusion. Wow. Um, and we now have a template which is sort of the vast majority of the basic questions that we've gotten over the years, which we send to all investors who, you know, are thinking about investing in one of our funds um, in the hope that that will answer all of their questions. It doesn't always, and sometimes we have to put something else in there, but um, yeah. for the most part, it does. I, I do think that this situation is enormously complicated um you know for a global firm you have the issue of there are differences between the europeans and the americans in terms of how they think about this but sure. then there's just the whole value chain issue right so you would say tesla is an environmentally forward company right you would you would say that or we would all say that but 
um, if 12 year olds are mining the cobalt for the batteries in the Congo sure. and where in the value chain are you supposed to be um, as a person who's sort of looking at this kind of thing. So I do think uh, one thing that's great about the European regulations is there is this sort of taxonomy or, you know, vocabulary that you use and it's a little bit more uh, consistent across a whole bunch of different firms. Now, it's also complicated by, if you take Riverside, for example, we have, you know, companies that are technology companies or even dating companies versus manufacturing companies. And so how you can't, it's very hard to measure the same thing across all of those. It's not even relevant for a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Just because you're, um, you know, selling or building um, solar power or something doesn't mean that you're a responsibly run business that's, you know, doing good for your community necessarily. That in and of itself doesn't doesn't resolve it. Um, you got to look at the, the whole value chain, stakeholders, shareholders. Um, so, yeah, it can get complicated. So, so we talked about those limited partners, those LPs and they're, you know, they have whatever ambitions they have that they're pressuring them, of course, being the prospects and the customers of a private equity firm. What, what else might be driving, or I guess I'll say policy and regulation. So maybe the, the stick, if you will, uh, or maybe there's a carrot in there, but um, ESG data requirements, the capture, the reporting, what kind of policy and regulations are you coming up against and, and what kind of maybe evolution do you see around the corner? Well, you know, I think in the U S the regulatory environment will, um, largely focus on public companies first and then we'll trickle down to, to private capital. Um, you know, it will be, it would be helpful to shape it, but, um, you, you talked about the carrot and the stick, Dick Ryan, and uh, I think people sometimes forget that investors carry an awfully big stick, right? Because um, and if an investor will only give you money because you do X, Y, and Z, uh, you're going to do X, Y, and Z. That's that's pretty critical. Yeah, I, I think I, a, a, uh, an investor reminded me of that on a call this morning. <laughs> actually, <laughs> remember we carry a big stick, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, I, so I do think the ability to aggregate data and um, sort of be very clear about where is it that I need to focus my effort, um, or even to report out whether it's to regulators or to investors, um, is going to be hugely helpful. And I don't think. Certainly in, in America, that is not where the industry is. I mean, you, you guys probably know that better than anybody. Um, that it, we just, you know, we have a lot to do and, and this has been less of a priority than perhaps it should be. I, I have often said that for private equity, I really think it should be GSE instead of ESG because we talk about the governance and I sort of feel like if you get the governance right, other good things will follow, but you know, we need probably more focus than we've had. Yeah, I think that's great. And, and you got me thinking, you know, the reason we love engaging and working with private equity and why Gobi, you know, that's, that's our, our audience is because of that incredible impact that private equity has on communities, socially, the environment enabling businesses. So sure, we could, you know, go to medium sized businesses one by one by one and try and engage them on ESG and, e and bettering ESG performance. But if we partner with private equity firms, you've already got what a hundred companies that, that you engage with. So we, we love taking on that challenge that you brought up earlier. How do we normalize some of this information so that we can make it useful in scale to a hundred companies, which can be challenging. And that's the challenge we're excited to take on. But yeah, I mean, working with, with private equity, we get to, I think, expedite or have a bigger impact in the amount of firms that we're making, you know, supporting in their, in telling their ESG story. So we're working for you, we're working for private equity firms, but you're working for LPs and, and you have investments that you need to operate and, 
so so yeah we love the the ecosystem um, you know Ryan, you just reminded me. So I once asked this question of, of a CIO of a pension fund, and I won't say where. Um, and this particular pension fund gives a, a diversity and inclusion award, uh, a diversity award. And so I said, let's just suppose you have two funds, and they're both top quartile funds for performance, but one, which has no diversity at all, is at the top of the top quartile. And the other one, which has a lot of diversity in decision making, is at the bottom of the top quartile. Who gets the money? And there was no answer to that question. So I have a feeling that the, the same is for the moment, at least true on ESG, which is if you don't have the returns, you could be great on ESG, but frankly, um, it, it matters less than your returns. But I think increasingly, yeah. if your returns are the same and the world has become more and more competitive, this this will be the thing that will make you stand out that your esg reporting is really good and you have a good policy and you're very focused on it well and they say that there's a correlation between the two as well right so someone who's a good steward of esg initiatives is probably a good steward of your money and doing all the right things anyway so right. it's hard to say like causation correlation but there's definitely um, a connection between the two but yeah, understood that it's it's still all about the financial returns. And even um, I remember being on a webinar and hearing a woman talking about how they passed on an investment opportunity because of an ESG issue that came up in due diligence. But it wasn't just because of the ESG issue. That specific ESG issue had material financial impacts on the performance of the business. It was something in the supply chain that, um, you know, should it go wrong or whatever it was, it would tank the whole company or whatever it was. So it was an ESG issue, but it was like more of a, you know, financial decision, I guess, if you will. But well, and had I think had those, sorry, go uh, ahead. had they not had those ESG questions in, incorporated into the due diligence process, they may never have exposed that specific issue. Exactly. I also think sometimes uh, an ESG issue could be symptomatic of a deeper values issue. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we're very reliant on the people who run these companies. So, Ryan, so. Um, you know, I think I think we want to we do want to make sure that we're working with good people, you know, and so those people are going to just be forward thinking on ESG. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. Um, so a lot of the folks that I've been talking to recently, specifically, I'd say in the mid market PE space, they're looking to implement an ESG program, or like I said, they're looking to take their homegrown program um, and engage uh, a third party like Gobi to help them take it to the next level as they go to raise um, their next fund. So what I'm kind of getting at is that a lot of times the, the upping the game of the ESG program comes along with the fundraising. So how do you balance doing ESG for the right reasons, if you will, but also, of course, wanting to reap the benefits of the obvious PR marketing benefits of having the program? Well, if I think if, if the PR pro part of the program drives people to do the right thing, then that's probably good. That said, I think investors are very smart and they, they totally get if you're greenwashing. I mean, is this really part of your DNA? Is it something that you do every day, that you do it, you look at every single deal, that if I ask you about this one specific company over here, you can tell me about it um, versus this is just a, a thing I'm doing because I have to. Um, I also think, you know, that the regulatory environment is going to come to a theater near you soon. <laughs> And so you better be you better be prepared uh, to be able. Unfortunately, we don't yet know what is going to be required in terms of reporting. Um, but we, I think, being able to show the SEC that you're doing something in this regard is going to be helpful. Just uh, the I same way as cyber, you know. Sure. I love you. you said the investors are are smart. I think we don't always. <laughs> People in general don't always respect their audience enough and think if you have, you know, an answer, it's good enough. But um, people are smart and they've gotten smarter about ESG and, and uh, you know, we're, we're not as uh, where Europe is, but we are starting to have some language that's a little bit more consistent and a little bit, uh, you know, we can more easily have the discussions. But yeah, if you respect your audience, then you have to provide 
information and an answers with authenticity. And then, you know, if you shake them a little bit, they hold up. It's just so much better than trying to check a box and greenwashing and all that stuff that happened before. And if you think you don't think that the people that you're telling your story to are smart, um, you're probably going to end up being wrong and embarrass yourself. So I, I completely agree with that. I mean, I think it's, it's a thing I say to people in Washington all the time when, you know, the, there's a heavy focus on regulation and I am often sort of the person who says, but wait, you know, in private equity, our investors know more about us than anybody else. I mean, they, they are, they're asking us about absolutely everything. They're in our offices for hours. Yeah. Well, they used to be in our offices for hours. Now they're yeah. on Zoom for hours. Right. Yeah. Um, so how different is this? If we look back, you became a COO for private equity in 2006. Um, how does that, you know, is this, were you having similar conversations where they started? Um, what was happening in 2006 compared to maybe, you know, the kind of conversation we're having 15 years later? So, you know, the world has gotten so much more competitive. It's uh, quite extraordinary. I just, I was sort of looking at some statistics. Um, so between the years of 2006 and 2008, about $2 trillion was raised in private markets. Mm. Today, that number stands at $6 trillion. Um, uh -huh. The number of private equity-backed companies has doubled um, from 4,000 to 8,000 at the same time as publicly held companies have decreased. Yeah. Um, and I think multiples, because of all this competition, multiples are super, super high. So so that old 80s adage, which I think US, US News wrote this in 2006, that you know private equity is totally different today. You know, they say that they're, they're not, uh, the guys who come in and buy a company and just tear it apart and, and wreck everything. Now they're just trying to make inefficient companies more profitable. Um, and to some degree, I think that's true. In fact, I'm doing a, a session on private equity 101 for our CEOs. And one of the things I'm saying is you have to grow because the multiple we have paid for your company is so high that there's just no possibility that we can, you know, do anything other than grow. Yeah, buy cheaper chairs or like, you know. Right. Yeah, you just, you can't save your way to prosperity, you know, you just yeah. can't. Um, so, so there has to be a path to growth. And, and I think, I think that, um, that has changed and, you know, and yet, you know, the, the view of the world is that um, private equity does really bad things. And so I don't, but I don't think anybody really wants to hear from the moguls of private equity. I think they want to hear from people like you. I mean, you or, you know, any of, any of the companies in the Riverside portfolio where people have gotten the benefit of both our financial capital and our intellectual capital um, to yep. be helpful. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, entrepreneurs, if I may, you know, we have enough arrogance to get a company so far. Um, but then I like to think enough brains to know that, you know, getting a company to 20 people and 15 customers, that's one thing, you know, going from there to a thousand customers and, you know, having hundreds of employees and, uh, how that's how that is different from you know bootstrapping a million dollar company is is it's a big difference and we really need support and can really expedite things when when you have that kind of support so you know taking the guidance the leadership in addition to the capital and then now having some ESG kind of guide rails as well to know that well my private equity organization is asking us the kind of things that um, are important. So we don't have to own all of that because, you know, someone has the lead on, here's what the LPs are saying, here's what the regulations are, here's how you can do it effectively and, and we can guide you along the way. So um, 
so yeah, no, it's, 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 I a, mean, it's scaling very... is really hard. I, I once, um, I had a friend, uh, who, who was an entrepreneur and he sold his company for a mere $6 billion. And, but I said to him, how did you deal with, you know, if you had to fire someone and he said, we were growing so fast, it really didn't matter. You know, I could have had the the world's poorest performer, and it was irrelevant to me because we were growing so quickly. So there's that arrogance. There is that arrogance, exactly. There it is. So totally. No, but there's something totally to different. be said for it. I mean, you guys have the experience. You guys have, um, and now you have the vested interest as well. So you live, you learn. You live, you learn. You live, you learn. You guys have lived and learned across. You know, seven hundred and fifty transactions. If you that's right, that's you know. right. So we'll take that. And you guys, it's more than just a course. Like you could get some of that from peer networking groups and entrepreneur groups and Ryan's and the founders network and that kind of thing. But those people don't have skin in the game. They're not going to help you. You know, the way that you guys have. But um, so so one other thing too. You talked about policy, um, and I know that you do a lot of work with the American Investment Council, just as an advocate for private equity. Um, in general, and kind of like you said, just debunking that it's not this like evil ivory tower. And and I think that's something that I would like love to help debunk as well, because our experience with you guys specifically in under 12 months or just about 12 months has been um, monumentally effective and helpful in, in running our own business and couldn't have done it without you guys. But anyway, so as an advocate, um, and you talk about this policy kind of coming and it's going to um, It'll be, how did you say, on your plate soon? Oh, in a theater near you soon, but I forgot what a theater is. On your on your couch in your living room soon. <laughs> exactly, it'll be streaming um, to you soon. <laughs> yeah, so how is that work specifically important to, to Riverside's mission and to, to making sure that you, know, you guys remain viable and are able to do what you want to do? You know, it's funny, our CEO, one of our CEOs said to me one day, I don't actually feel like a bad person. And yet, when I read about myself <laughs> in the Wall Street Journal, um, you know, I'm kind of the access of all evil. Um, and so, so that's why I feel so strongly it is a largely myth debunking. But in a certain way, one of the great things for me about spending time in Washington has been understanding how many things everybody there has to know. I mean, so I'm in line to come talk about private equity and the next person's coming to talk about corn and the next person's coming <laughs> to talk about oil and the next, and you know, these poor representatives and senators, I mean, you know, they have to know so much. It's just yeah. extraordinary. So things that are very obvious to me are not at all obvious um, to the, to the, group in Washington. So, so much of it is education. And for a long time, the private equity industry just wasn't in Washington because, you know, we were just doing our thing, you know, keeping our yeah. heads down, you know, buying our companies, trying to, trying to help them grow and figure out how to grow and then giving, um, you know, making some money for our investors. So it came, I think, as a great shock to everybody after the financial crisis, which is really when it um, started that suddenly people thought something completely different, but it shouldn't have been a surprise because yeah. we never told anybody what we did. So, yeah. so yeah. now, now we're spending a lot of time trying to say, but, but wait, this is what, and, and I don't think people want to hear from, you know, the, the Henry Kravitz's and the Steve Schwartzman's, I think they want to hear from you, Healy. Sure. You know, yeah, one of yeah. the great lines of all time, I think, was, you know, the only difference between a entrepreneur's great 3 a.m. idea and a company is capital. I think that's one of the great lines. Yeah, no, and it's the truth. And I like how you guys as well have put, um, I'm talking with other private equity firms, you guys do the ESG, but then you also have plus V, plus your values. And mm -hmm. you guys like to put that front and center. And I, I admire that because I think it, um, it makes your firm seem more human you have these values, you have these guiding principles, and it's not just at the firm level. These are principles that you want to um, kind of uh, put upon the investments as well and make sure that they're in line and they fall in line with your values. So I like how you guys have made that front and center um, and, and not just for your firm, but also, you know, when you guys are going through your annual ESG index, you're actually surveying the investments the portfolio companies with regards to values in addition to ESG. So that's something right. I think unique and neat to Riverside. 
So good job. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, um, let's dig in a little. We're talking ESG here, and we're the day after International Women's Day. Um, let's talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion. Diversity, of course, the consideration of having a diverse um, group of, of humans at a particular firm, um, you know, with ethnicity, culture, race, gender, and then, of course, inclusion, meaning um, are we actually including uh, that diverse group and giving and, and making sure there's opportunities and growth um, for everyone. So as one of the few and the most senior C-suite women in private equity, uh, maybe you could share a little bit about your initiatives to promote diversity. Maybe you're even paying it forward or maybe advise listeners that, and that could be, you know, private equity and or um, investments, um, you know, on, on how you've, you've done this in, in your career or, or with uh, Riverside. Well, <laughs> you know, just in terms of my own, I, w I would say that for myself, I never considered it an issue. You know, I thought I was qualified to be in any room and I thought I was just as smart as everybody else. And um, over time, I realized that that's not true for everybody. Um, so a lot of the time it's helping uh, bolster confidence. But I think it's also really about networks. Um, if, you, if you keep going to the same network all the time, you're going to get the same people. Um, so you've got to be willing to experiment. You've got to be willing to say, take someone, okay, yes, you know, typically the, you, you go to college, you go to an investment bank, you go to private equity. All right, well, what if I turn that model on its head and I take someone straight out of college or... I take, you know, someone who's had a completely different background in an operating company um, because they're really smart. And I, I think we can teach them. But I really like this candidate. So, you know, we've done that a few times. I actually had one of my managers say to me one time, okay, I have three experiments going on. Could you just not give me any more for right now? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm happy to say, you know, a lot of them worked out. One didn't, but a lot of them worked out. Um, so, so I think that's really good. Um, earlier today, I, I was on this call with Anthony Jack, who's a Harvard professor, and he wrote this book called The Privileged Poor and How Elite Colleges Are Failing Disadvantaged Students. Um, and he pointed out that a college might might get an award for being really diverse in its student body, but if you went to Andover and Exeter to get all of those students, then are they really diverse? Probably not. So that's one right. issue. And then the second issue is once the person gets to the culture, think about the vocabulary and the cultural um, and what are you doing to train to to teach people what that culture means? So. Uh, Professor Jack gave this example, and he said, um, so when he went to Amherst as an undergrad, people would talk about fellowship, which in, you know, in Amherst code was a dorm. But for him, growing up as an of color young man in the South, fellowship either had to do, as he said, with religion or food. And so it was just a totally different thing. So I think, you know, that's, that's what we have to... Um, to, to really think about, there's just a lot of things we have to change. But the great news is, I have increasingly seen so many firms started by women. Uh, so many uh, of my women friends, you know, really working together to to try to solve this and helping each other, which I think is different. I think there was a generation of women who are not as supportive of each other I as totally they agree. are today, you know? I totally agree. I don't even know if it's generational. It's like up to the, the individual I've had. I think even to my time at JLL, I think I had something like nine managers in eight years. And some women couldn't have been bigger advocates, helpers, wanting to promote other young women and help them kind of rise to the ranks. And others couldn't have been more of like a barrier or a deterrent. It was just almost dependent on the personality or the person. but. Um, but at the end of the day, isn't it just a Kellogg thing? It's a Kellogg thing. <laughs> Maybe it's a Kellogg thing. I don't know. I think it's just, I really feel strongly about, um, you know, being a team and helping each other where we can. I really do. I just thank well, you. Well, I, I love your advice of um, 
I, I think you're talking to, I don't know, maybe to me or, or, you know, others of find a different network. If you just go back to the same pool every time. And, and I think that's very interesting. And, and I have after, you know, learning and being inspired over the, the last couple of years, specifically made an effort to find other networks and look at my own. And basically the way to do this, is look at my LinkedIn network and then look at it a year later, um, you know, and make some headway there. And I think this is a good spot to plug the, um, ESG hub on our website because we had a conversation with what you were talking about where you've got to make very specific efforts as a firm to create diversity having like one training or something at the beginning of the year for everyone doesn't quite do it you've got to go yeah. you've got to say we're going to hire this way we're going to you know have this kind of mentor active mentor program you know we're going to do very specific things and not just kind of a blanket policies. So that's great. And then celebrating, I think the, the thing that we put, we put out yesterday, the content that we researched and put out yesterday was about how women are leading the way in ESG. Interestingly yes, enough, I saw that. a particular area. Yeah. It's, um, and there's some cool stuff in there about, you know, why that might be, um, but not to totally derail us, but uh, yeah, very interesting. Yeah. I'm a proponent too of a, a meritocracy. You know, I think it should always be the best person for the job, whether that's, I don't think there should be quotas totally of like women and minorities. Like it really should just be at the end of the day. Like if a 45 year old white male is interviewed the best and has the best qualifications, the best for the job, then go for it. But at the same time, I recognize the importance of, you know, what NASDAQ has done by trying to put out some of these mandates to, to fix what's just become um, the way it is and requiring, you know, one female and, and one minority on boards uh, that are NASDAQ listed. So things like that have to happen. But um, at the same time, I think it's about uh, advocacy from the top. So if you've risen up through the ranks, like you have Pam, and you're in a position of power, and you can help and, and facilitate, you know, women, minorities, etc. But keeping in mind that, like I said, I really do feel strongly that it should be a meritocracy. But I also recently told, um, so speaking of Kellogg, my brother is in the program now, and his group interviewed me for their um, leadership project. And one of the things I told them too, they're like, well, what can we do to promote diversity? You know, we're just going to business school now. We're young in our careers. Like you should be demanding it. You should be demanding it of your companies. You should go to your companies. You should look at the board makeup. You should ask why your face is not represented there and you should demand it and make it happen. And you can be an advocate just as much in that position as, you know, in, in your position, having been at Riverside for 16 years. Um, so I think it comes from from everywhere. The pressure has to come from from all around. Yeah, I, I I completely agree. I mean, I think, frankly, one of the silver linings in COVID is that for a long time we had this uh, group of people who believed that you had to have FaceTime, and I think anybody who believed that has been proven wrong now. And so while I totally agree that you need the creative combustion of being together some of the time. I don't think you need to have it all the time. And I think much more flexibility in terms of work arrangements is going to be the norm now. Oh going yeah, forward. So I think that's great. For sure. Big digression from ESG, but hey. Ah, it's all incorporated under the umbrellas of ESG or in Riverside's case, ESG and B. Right, right. Or GS and E. Yes, GS I really do e think GS and E. Um, you know, one thing I was going to say just on the, um, you know, women in private equity, I, I do think generally, if you look out and you don't see anybody who looks like you, that's a challenge. So one of the things that I personally do just in terms of paying it forward, you know, is, you know, I'm obviously a, a female in private equity. So, you know, to the extent I can embrace the women at Riverside, I will do that. Um, you know, and that's been helpful. Yeah, that sure makes sense. Good. Um, one more question, Healy, or you want me to get to I the next? I think we kind of covered like these these other ones and what we were just talking about now. Um, oh, good. We can move on then to the next segment of our podcast. Yeah, let's move on to the next segment. Really appreciate that conversation and your expertise, Pam. We get to talk about it a lot at Gobi and amongst each other. And it's always um, more meaningful to actually talk to someone who's, um, you know, living it and who we're trying to serve and support and, and do so to get your point of view. Um, it's very meaningful to us and hopefully to, to the people listening. Um, and it's very important stuff. We're gonna lighten it up just a little bit. 
and we've got a segment here. It's called Beer or Beans. And all you have to do, Pam, is guess in this world of artisan and craft. I have selected either a craft brewery or a craft coffee place. You just have to tell me. I'm going to tell you the name. All you have to say is if it's beer or beans. That's all you have to do. Um, do you know, first I'm going to ask you this. Do you know in North Carolina, rumor is you're familiar with North Carolina, do you know there's a city known as the Queen City? You familiar with this or no? I did not know that, but I oh. will take your word for it. Check it out. Yeah, Charlotte is the Queen City, and okay. they're fighting with Cincinnati about which one is actually the Queen City. So that's another thing. So anyway, this place is in Charlotte. It's called Smelly Cat. Oh, give me a break. Coffee. That's correct. That's correct. <laughs> uh, at Smelly Cat, they say, we know beans, and I like this because it's uh, diverse. One coffee style does not fit all. We roast our own ethically sourced beans to create a wide range of profiles to fit the wide range of coffee drinkers in the Queen City and beyond. So they don't sponsor us, but maybe they want to call and sponsor us. But um, congratulations, uh, you were correct. Oh, phew, thank goodness. <laughs> one for one, that's amazing. That's one way one. better than my record when we don't have guest speakers and I have to do beer and beans. I'm not 100% um, accuracy like you are. Yeah. Well, um, don't ask me another one because I quit. My mother always told me to quit while I was ahead. So, <laughs> well, how did you? How were you so sure though that Smelly Cat? Because you know it, or is there some? Is there am I missing something? How are you so sure that that was coffee? Oh, I. It just it sort of linked in my brain. Huh. huh. Uh, you know. Smelly Cat. Uh, uh. Well, you know, good. smelly it wouldn't be smelly if it had a good place to go to the bathroom and I don't know. So it just seemed more like beans than brew. <laughs> <laughs> Why you gotta grill her on her correct answer? Okay. Oh, I mean, I'm trying, right. to, learn. I'm trying to learn a system for uh, how you might know something like that. But, uh, well done. Right. But I didn't know about that. I didn't know what it was. No. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you to our hundreds of thousands of loyal listeners for joining us on the ESG Experience podcast. Our next episode is going to focus on diversity and inclusion in commercial real estate, and we will be joined by special guest Anna Murray, Managing Director, Global Head of ESG for Bentall Green Oak. Looking forward to that. Um, make sure you tune in and follow us on your favorite social media handle channel at hashtag ESG experience. Catch you next time. Thanks again, Pam. Thanks. Bye-bye.